Greetings, my name is Frida Wimsat, and this is Chapter 17. We're going to talk about the labor and birth complications. Obstetrical procedures, versions, external versions for external cephalic versions, and also internal versions. The internal version is used the most often in the twin vaginal deliveries to assist in the birth of the second fetus. Uh, the provider inserts a hand inside the uterus and change the presentation from breech to cephalic. Typically when we when there's a delivery of twins vaginally the mother does deliver inside of the c-section room with an epidural on board uh, just in case we have to do a c-section. The induction of labor? Well, the induction of labor depends upon the Bishop score, and that Bishop score monitors uh, the probability of a successful induction by the evaluation of the woman's cervix. And the woman's cervix is evaluated for uh, effacement. That's how thin the cervix is. It's also evaluated for dilation, the station of the baby um, and cervical consistency, whether it's firm, medium, or soft, and also the cervical position, whether it's posterior, mid position, or anterior. And it's based on uh, the th three scores, zero to one, two, and three, just like everything else in OB. Uh, where you're given a zero, one, two, or three. The dilation, if it's zero, uh, typically it's zero points. If it's one to two, it's one point. Three to four, there's two points. And five or greater, there's three points. Effacement, um, if it's greater than 80% effaced, that's a three. The station, if it's uh, one, plus one or plus two, that's three points. If it's minus one to zero station, right at the ischial spines, that's two points. Cervical consistency, if it's soft, of course, it's either two or three points. Medium is one point. And cervical position, uh, it, if it's anterior, the person is awarded two or three points. And the goal with the Bishop score is to total eight or more uh, for the likelihood of vaginal birth. This is an external version that you're seeing here. And you can see what the examiner does is they push the baby up the breech portion up out of the pelvic inlet, up near the, the false pelvic where the brim is to where they can then manipulate or rotate the baby um, to a cephalic presentation. So in letter B, you can see how they're pushing the buttocks up towards the woman's diaphragm and they're guiding the back of the fetal head down towards the pelvis. obstetrical procedures continued. The cervical ripening methods, when a woman comes in, she has to be induced. If her cervix is long, thick, and closed, the first thing that we have to do is soften the cervix. And there are several um, agents that can be used to achieve this. They are, the chemical agents would be prostaglandins, then there's the mechanical and physical methods, and of course there's alternative methods, and then the amniotomy. Prostaglandins, uh, prostaglandin E uh, is usually a uh, cytotec, mesoprestol, which is cytotec. And cytotec is only used primarily for women who may have um, a fetal demise. That's what I have seen it used for anyways, because it is so powerful and it leads to uh, tachycystole so often that that it could lead to an emergency cesarean section and most of the time they'll give it to people who 
need to um, deliver a baby who is already uh, demised. But prostaglandin E2, which is your cervidials and your prepideal gels, those are used routinely for um, softening of the cervix to prep them for an induction the next morning. Typically, the woman will come in that evening around about 6 p.m., go through the admission process, uh, have the uh, non-stress test uh, completed, and um, get everything situated. They will insert the cervidial and leave that in for like 12 hours. And then in the morning, around about 6 or 7 in the morning, they would remove the cervidial and start her, start her Pitocin at that point. With either one of these prostaglandins, she may start labor spontaneously without the need of Pitocin. That's always um, a, a probability. The drawback with the prostaglandins is that they can cause uterine test tachycystole um, and fetal hypoxemia and fetal distress because of consistent contractions without a break in between the contractions. The mechanical dilators, they ripen the cervix by stimulating the release of endogenous prostaglandins. There's the Foley catheter method that can be inserted through the end intracervical canal to ripen and dilate the cervix. Usually the catheter balloon is inflated above the internal cervical os until 30 to 50 and filled up with like 30 to 50 milliliters of sterile water and then it will start to release endogenous prostaglandins to cause her to soften. And when the cervix, uh, when the cervix reaches about three centimeters, the catheter will then fall out. There's the hydros hydroscopic dilators where they actually absorb fluid from the surrounding tissues and then enlarge. And then there's the laminar tents. They're the natural cervical dilators made from uh, desiccated seaweed. There's the lamb seal, which is a synthetic dilators that containing uh, magnesium sulfate can be inserted endocervical without rupture of membranes. There's the synthetic dilators. Typically, what they do is they swell faster. They will enlarge with less discomfort, and but the results are less deliveries, less uterine tachycystole, less fetal distress, and uh, but they there's no change in the C-section rate based on whether you use the uh, synthetic dilators or the ones that are non. And then the amniotomy. The amniotomy is the, where they're going to make sure that the presenting part is well applied to, uh, is well inside of the inlet, right, to, so that the cord cannot proceed past the presenting part. And they're going to make sure that, uh, that there's no placenta previa present. And in all of those situations, what they would do is uh, rupture the amniotic sac with an amni hook. And that's the physician or the nurse midwife would do this. Nurses don't do amniotomies, certainly. And the nurses assist with it by providing towels and making sure that the documentation is right and keeping up with um, how much output um, the, the woman experiences with her membranes being ruptured. And also keeps a tight um, assessment by monitoring the temperature every two hours on the mom afterwards to make sure that um, it, there's no infection present. The first thing that they that you measure as a nurse when the doctor or midwife performs an amniotomy is are the fetal heart tones. You make sure that they, you do a non-stress test beforehand, that everything is fine, and then with the amniotomy you watch for a sharp decline or bradycardia uh, or variable deceleration after the rupture of membranes because that would be an indication of a prolapse cord. Okay. Now there can be some transient feta tachycardia is very common after the rupture of membranes, but any type of deceleration 
must be watched very carefully. What the nurse would document after an amniotomy is um, certainly she's going to record the fetal heart rate pattern before and after the procedure, but she's also going to record the color of the fluid, whether there's odor present, the consistency of the fluid, and the presence or absence of meconium or blood within the amniotic fluid. And the time of rupture. The time of rupture is very, very important because typically we don't want to leave someone ruptured longer than 18 hours. In that case, there's a greater risk of infection. Oxytocin. Oxytocin, of course, is um, the hormone that is produced by the hypothalamus and stored in the posterior pituitary that causes uterine contractions. And the synthetic portion of oxytocin is called pitocin. Uh, and this uh, certainly is necessary in order to stimulate uterine contractions before uh, to deliver the baby and then afterwards to clamp down on the uterine arteries to uh, prevent excessive bleeding. Okay. We do use uh, oxytocin or pitocin, excuse me, a lot to induce labor and also to augment labor that's progressing slowly because of inadequate uterine contractions. The procedure goes like this. She comes in, she gets all consent signed, etc. As I said before, she may have had uh, the Cervidil, and then that morning we're going to start the Pitocin drip. We make sure that she has an 18-gauge catheter in her non-dominant arm. Usually we try to get the cephalic vein is a good choice because it's larger. Uh, and it's less likely to infiltrate during all of the movements and pushing, etc. The primary fluids are hung via, via gravity, usually lactated ringers or normal saline, uh, and administered uh, intravenously through a second line is, of course, is the pitocin. So we get an anesthesia tubing for the primary line for that uh, lactated ringers, and that goes directly to the, the IV site. And then the second tubing is a, a primary pump tubing, okay, primary pump tubing that we attach to the IV bag that's going to contain Pitocin. And you run that through the pump and you take the pump tubing and you attach it as a piggyback to the anesthesia tubing at the lowest port near the IV site. And the reason they do that is to ensure that if we ever have to bolus this woman with fluids because of a variable or late deceleration, you can't bolus her with a line that has Pitocin in it. So the fact that Pitocin is the piggyback and it's at the lowest port, then it's very easy to clamp that and not allow any Pitocin when you're bolusing her. And it's a safety mechanism, or um, to, it's, it's used as a safety precaution. And of course, oxytocin must be administered via pump uh, when a baby is on board. The goal of uh, oxytocin administration is to produce acceptable uterine contractions as evidenced by consistent achievement of at least 200 to 220 Montevideo units uh, on a 20-minute strip. And this is what we mean by that. We're going to take the look at a strip and you look at the mom's contractions and you you calculate the summation of the resting pressures, the times that are in between contractions for that 20 minute strip, and you subtract that from the summation of the ACME pressures, and that would be the peak of those contractions within that 20 minute period. And it should be around 200 to 220 uh, Montevideo units uh, as a result of that. And that tells us that the Pitocin uh, is providing adequate contractions. Pitocin is also used uh, as a form of augmentation, but they usually give them like half of the dosage for augmentation as they would for um, a normal induction with Pitocin. One of the major risk factors of oxytocin is uh, water intoxication. So you want to make sure that you're listening to this mom and doing a, a thorough assessment and listening to her breath sounds to make sure that uh, she's not filling up with fluid and watching the edema uh, present. 
it is a high alert medication. The probability of placental abruption, uterine rupture, especially if she's had a previous cesarean section with a, um, a T-shaped uh, incision. It can proceed to unnecessary cesarean birth as a result of tachycystole and fetal distress. Uh, after birth hemorrhage because once the cells are saturated with oxytocin because she's been on a Pitocin drip for 12 or so hours, then after delivery, they're already saturated. So they're less, it's less effective in contracting the uterus after delivery, and that leads to a possible hemorrhage. And then, of course, infection uh, is because of ascending infections, because they're usually ruptured when they start Pitocin, and then fetal hypoxemia and acidemia, just because of consistent contractions over a long period of time, especially if uh, she has an arrest of, of descent and there's no progress being made. Here's a mom here present with an IV pump there, as you can see, and she's positioned on her side So um, augmentation of labor, as we said before, can occur with Pitocin, but another form of augmentation of labor we talked about before Pitocin, and that was amniotomy. Uh, those are forms of augmentation of labor. That means she's actually started on her own, but she just needs a little bit of incentive or a little extra help to increase the strength of her contractions. Okay, maybe she's started in labor and she's having uh, really good contractions, but they are not as uh, effective at um, changing her cervix in, in a normal amount of time. So, so the common augmentation methods include the uh, oxytocin, of course, and amniotomies. Operative vaginal births, um, they are achieved with either forceps or a vacuum extractor. And uh, the definition there of a forceps assisted birth is one in which an instrument with two curved blades is used to assist in the birth of the fetal head. The cephalic-like curve of the forceps commonly used is similar to the shape of the fetal head with the pelvic curve to the blades conforming to the curve of the pelvic axis. And the blades are joined together either by a pin or a screw and a lot of times by a groove arrangement. They can lock in order to prevent the forceps from actually compressing the fetal skull, which is a great thing. And there are several types of forceps assisted births defined primarily by the station and the position of the fetal head in relationship to the maternal pelvis. So what we have is we have... Um, forceps, and I'll show you a picture of forceps in just a moment, that are um, for the outlet, and that's where the fetal scalp is visible on the perineum without manually separating the labia. And then there's the low forceps, and that's where the fetal head is at least at the plus two station. And there's the mid pelvis where the fetal head is engaged, but no higher than zero station, okay? Uh, engaged but above the plus two station but no higher than zero station so that baby's head is between the initial spines and the plus two station. If they won't go any higher than the initial spines with forceps because they need to typically at that point just do a c-section. The physician is the one who typically does forceps deliveries and both blades are positioned by the physician and handles are locked. Uh, traction is usually applied during the woman's contractions. And if the fetal heart rate decelerations occur, forceps are then removed and of course reapplied. There's lots of um, uh, consideration to make sure that the cord is not compressed between the fetal head and the forceps that will cause a decrease in fetal heart rate. So one of the main things that nurses do is monitor those fetal heart tones during this procedure. They document the time the, the, the time the forceps were placed, whether they were 
uh, outlet low or mid pelvis forceps, whether what the heart rate was when they were applied and um, how the mom's contractions are and whether there's progress being made. So there's lots of information to keep up with. The nurse's job also is a client teaching to make sure that she's informing the, the patient exactly what's going on and the reason for it and what the patient can do to assist with the procedure and informing her, you know, uh, providing reassurance. The maternal assessment, uh, vaginal or cervical lacerations need to be monitored for uh, continuously. Uh, urinary retention, a hematoma formation in the pelvic soft tissues, which can result from the blood vessel damage, and of course, assessment of the neonate, uh, lots of bruising or abrasions, uh, sometimes facial palsy, and uh, subdural hematomas as a result of the forceps there. A vacuum-assisted um, birth, the physician is going to apply a vacuum cap to the fetal head using negative pressure to assist in delivery of the fetal head. So, and um, it's not used to assist if the gestation is prior to 34 weeks, and that is because it's a risk for intraventricular hemorrhage. The nurse or the tech will attach the suction tube into either the wall or to a separate hand pump, and I've usually only seen the separate hand pumps. They would generate the amount of pressure that the physician actually requests, but on the gauge itself, there's a, um, a green zone and then there's a, a red zone, and no matter what the physician says, you're not to exceed the green zone, even if they ask. You're to say in a very polite tone that's above the green zone because people who are in the midst of this, their sympathetic nervous system is going up just like everybody else. So, and that's part of the teamwork is to, you know, just to communicate with them, uh, with the healthcare provider. A cap it does develop. It's called a Chagon. It looks like the cap of the vacuum, but that does go down within like 24 to 48 hours. And what the nurse would document at this point would be the number of pulls attempted, uh, the maximum pressure used on the gauge, and any pop-offs that occurred because sometimes that vacuum will pop off of the fetal head and then the physician will have to reapply. And it depends on uh, what the policy is to where uh, the hospital policy is, but typically no more than two pop-offs are allowed. Now, assessment of the neonate would be she would look for uh, cephalohematomas or the Chagon, like I said, scalp lacerations or subdural hematomas. This is what the forceps looks like. Uh, there's several different types there. There's the Simpson, Elliott, Piper, Keelan, Bailey Williamson, and Tucker McLean. Here's a procedure with the forceps being applied by the physician, and as you can see there, um, he's making sure that they're locked in position. And actually, just and you can see how the forceps are curved, and they do go right along with the the, the fetal head in order to help. This is a picture of the vacuum extraction. You can see the chagon there in letter B. That's what I'm talking about. Um, and just remember the vacuum extraction is not used on the gestation prior to 34 weeks. Okay. And then the cesarean section. Cesarean birth, there's lots of indications like there can be an elective cesarean birth, but not as they're not as more they're not as common anymore as they were before elective cesarean births. Uh, there could be scheduled cesarean births, cer certainly if the woman has a, a reason, she has the type of pelvis, like a platypoid pelvis, or they know that she is going to, her pelvic inlet is not wide enough to, and it's not wide as the 9.5 centimeters that's needed to be, and um, if she's had a uterine incision that was a classical or a T incision before, 
then every baby subsequent is going to, of course, be a cesarean section. And so those would be scheduled C-sections. Unplanned cesarean birth would be because of a, um, an unplanned event that happened within the labor process, either an abruption, there's bleeding, there's uh, cephalic pelvic disproportion, there's fetal distress, etc. Forced cesarean birth and surgical techniques and the complications and risk and also anesthesia. So here are the types of C-section incisions. There's the letter A, there's a vertical, which is through the skin. And uh, hopefully there's a fanosteel on the uterine incision. Usually they will do a low vertical if the baby is really large, like a macrosomic infant, or if the woman has a placenta previa. You certainly can't do a fanosteel or a low transverse, which is here in letter B if a person has a placenta previa. But this is the preferred incision because especially with the skin and also with the uterus. They can also do a tummy tuck in this, um, with this incision. Incidentally, there was a story uh, recently about a patient who delivered who was COVID positive and she had twins on board. And the doctor went in and saw that her condition was deteriorating because she was in the ICU. And so he made a decision to get the babies out. Of course, she couldn't leave because she was COVID positive. So they brought the OR to the ICU unit and set up everything. They delivered the twins. They were around about 28, 29 weeks or so. The twins did fine. And the mother, consequently, her condition improved once the babies were, were birthed uh, because she didn't have to supply them with so much oxygen. She had enough to uh, sort of um, recover herself. And so that's a, that's a good story uh, how three people's lives were saved based on the decision to have a cesarean section. So obstetrical procedures, the care management. Um, this is what a C-section sort of looks like here. You can see here that the baby's out. And happy families. We try to do uh, baby-friendly C-sections now where the mom stays awake and she and the father is allowed to actually go in to be there when the baby's born and uh, the lights are not quite as bright and it, we try to make it a more friendly situation, a better uh, experience for the mom and the dad and the family all together. The trial of labor. Every woman will have a trial of labor. Uh, observation of a woman in her fetus for a specific length of time to assess safety of a vaginal birth before just assuming that she should have a cesarean birth. And vaginal birth after cesarean section, those are common uh, and they are especially appropriate when there's a low fanosteel incision on the, the, the uterus, okay? And so indications for primary cesarean birth such as dystocia, breech presentation, and fetal distress often are non-reoccurring and because of that situation, and also twins, because of that situation, she can probably have a vaginal birth after cesarean birth. Meconium stain amniotic fluid. This indicates that the fetus has passed the first stool before birth, but it also indicates that the fetus could have been at risk for uh, the fetus was hypoxic inside because what would cause the fetus in a cephalic presentation to pass a meconium stool is if the fetus is post date, which is, you know, past 41 weeks, or if the if the fetus, of course, is hypoxic because that will cause the anal sphincter to relax and, of course, allow the, the stool to pass. Okay, The possible um, complications as a result of the passage of meconium in the amniotic fluid is that that baby is also practicing breathing movements while he's in the amniotic fluid and so he's he can swallow the amniotic fluid and therefore if meconium's in there he can swallow that meconium into the lungs and then after birth that would precipitate meconium aspiration and also pneumonia and a very serious situation there.
that requires a lot of uh, neonatal resuscitation to take place. Obstetrical emergencies continue. We have shoulder dystocia. So shoulder dystocia, it doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it's a very scary situation. This is where the head is born, but the anterior shoulder cannot pass under the pubic arc. Remember how, how I said before that nobody has a pure pelvis. There's usually a combination of the different types of pelvic types. So um, the newborn is more likely to experience birth injuries with shoulder dystocia because we are in a, in a hurry to get the baby out because we don't want the baby to asphyxiate here uh, on the perineum. And one of the ways to do that would be uh, to break the baby's clavicle if necessary to cause that shoulder to fold down and allow for birth to take place. Other ways that we can get the baby out uh, would be uh, to do suprapubic pressure and which I'll show you in just a moment and McMar McRoberts maneuvers. The maternal complications would be of course hemorrhage and rectal injuries because we do everything we can to widen uh, that space to allow for the birth of that, that baby. This is what we look at and we call it suprapubic pressure. So you can see how the baby's shoulder is stuck at that pubic bone. What the provider will do or the nurse who's assisting will do is put pressure right there above the symphys pubis to press down on that shoulder to try to push that shoulder underneath the pubic bone. Another process would be here to deliver the posterior shoulder. And if they were to reach in and deliver the posterior shoulder, that might also provide enough room for the anterior shoulder to be delivered. The next uh, procedure would be to do McRoberts maneuvers. And McRoberts maneuvers, uh, in, in conjunction with suprapubic pressure, is non-invasive, easily learned, and performed very quickly. And it's in fact, when you practice procedures like this, is performed instinctually, okay? Uh, the, once that baby's head shows the turtle sign to where it comes out and it jets back in, uh, that's the turtle sign, because you know how turtles jump back into their shell. That's an indication that the shoulder is stuck and that it actually pulled the baby backwards into uh, the vagina. Then the nurse would immediately do suprapubic pressure and McRoberts maneuvers where you take the mom's knees and pull them as close to her earlobes as possible. And what that does, as you can see, is that it widens her pelvis to provide more room there. We avoid any type of fundal pressure where they're pushing on the fundus to help to push the baby out because that only makes the situation worse. And then the, there's another maneuver that was talked about in your textbook. It's called the Gaskin maneuver, where we're having the woman on her hands and her knees. And that's feasible. Uh, in physics, but it's unrealistic because typically you have these women who have had epidurals, they're not going to get up on their hands and knees at that point. And in fact, you don't have time to waste time to try to change her position other than the fact of putting her in the McRoberts maneuvers and doing a suprapubic pressure. Plus they're exhausted and if they're non-athletic or, or uh, significantly obese, that is just not the, the way to go with the Gaston maneuver. So, suprapubic pressure, McRoberts maneuver, and delivery of the posterior shoulder. Then there's the uh, prolapse umbilical cord, and we've talked about this uh, consistently going through this presentation, but the prolapse cord is where the cord lies below the presenting part of the fetus, and it's the same principle as hanging someone, okay? That's because it causes asphyxiation. And the contributing factors would include a very long cord, longer than 100 centimeters, malpresentation or breach, and uh, the transverse lie, or unengaged presenting part. And the interventions are if a prolapse cord occurs, you're to call for assistance immediately. Do not leave the woman alone. Have someone notify the obstetrical health care provider for you. You're going to put a gloved examining hand very quickly and insert two fingers into the vagina to the cervix with one finger on either side of the cord or both fingers to one side. 
however you do it, your goal is to exert upward pressure against the presenting part to relieve the compression of the cord. This letter A here is, I mean, I'm sorry, an occult prolapse cord because it's kind of hidden and you can see there how it's compressed and also right here how it's compressed within the thighs. And letter B here uh, would be, you can see that here are the arrows that indicate the direction of the pressure against the presenting part to relieve compression of the prolapse umbilical cord. As you can see here, the it's putting the fingers right there to push pressure. You're trying to push pressure upwards. And then here as well, pushing pressure upwards on the breech. So as we mentioned before, if the cord is protruding from the vagina, wrap it loosely in a sterile towel saturated with warm, sterile, normal saline. And usually in a labor suite, you have those supplies available readily at like on the countertops in the event that there's an emergency. So it's not like you're having to leave her to go and get these supplies. Here is the modified Sims position and the knee. Rupture of the uterus, a very serious obstetrical injury here. If that uterus ruptures, and usually there's, because the uterus is made out of like multiple muscles in a figure eight con configuration, right? That's how the muscle structure runs. So typically the uterus is not going to rupture all the way where it first completely open, but a lot of the layers will separate and you'll see like a little square window where the baby's inside just kind of waving at you through the uterus. And either way, it's serious injury for massive hemorrhage. Uh, the woman is in excruciating pain, as you could imagine, and shock, of course, is um, imminent if... In this situation, she has to go to C-section right away to help with the, the life of herself as well as the life of the baby. Of course, some signs and symptoms would be abnormal fetal heart rate tracing, loss of fetal station, abdominal pain, and then, of course, shock. Amniotic fluid embolism, uh, which is also known as anaphylactoid syndrome of pregnancy because we... This is an embolism where the amniotic fluid actually gets into the maternal bloodstream and it contains lots of debris. It's got the lanugo, the fine downy hair, it's got the vernix, the cheesy-like substance that covers the baby. It could have meconium, etc. So all of those debris particles floating there can uh, certainly uh, dislodge in her lungs. It's an acute onset of hypotension is what you would notice, hypoxia, cardiovascular collapse, and coagulopathy. And uh, the maternal mortality here is like 61% or higher. And neonatal outcome is also uh, very poor. This is a, um, a situation that doesn't happen very often. And thank God that it doesn't. Because if she is not in the OR, on the table in the OR, then chances of survival are, are really, really, really slim. What we would do is oxygenate her with non-rebreather face mask, resuscitation bag, delivery by 100% oxygen, try to get her intubated as soon as possible, tilt her to her side to displace her uterus, position her on her side, administer and increase her IV fluids, administer blood products, packed red blood cells, fresh frozen plasma. If she didn't have an indwelling catheter already, we would insert that to get her urinary output to keep track on that do um, some corrective measures for coagulation failure, monitor the fetal and maternal status, and prepare for emergency birth once the woman's condition is stabilized, and provide emotional support to the woman, her partner, and her family. Here's a question. A patient is to have an amniotomy to induce labor. The nurse recognizes that the priority intervention after the amniotomy is to do which of the following? And I hope that you would have stated it is to assess for the fetal heart rate to rule out the presence of a prolapse cord. Okay, I appreciate your time as always, and I hope that you have enjoyed the presentation.